Hi guys and welcome to TechTeamGB. In this video we're going to be covering how SSDs work both at a high level and a fairly in-depth level on all the way down to the NAND flash chips that actually store the data. So let's get started. So starting off at a relatively high level explanation, there are multiple types of SSD that you'll have likely heard of as a, an everyday consumer of, you know, PC enthusiast tech. Now the first one that I'd mention is the two and a half inch SATA SSD. These use a SATA data and SATA power connection, does require external power to the drive as opposed to just the single connection that goes into it and uses a six gigabit per second connection depending on what motherboard you're using and that's the fastest it can run. In terms of data rates, the fastest it can generally run is about 550 megabits, uh, megabytes per second uh, read and write, although that will be dependent on the drive and some drives can push it slightly further but uh, not too much further than uh, 550 to 600 megabytes per second. The next type of drive I mentioned is the M.2 NVMe drive. Now, M.2 and NVMe aren't uh, you know mutually exclusive. You can get SATA M.2 drives, but more and more commonly you will see drives like this 960 Pro, which uses NVMe technology to use up to 32 gigabits per second, which means that you can get multiple gigabytes per second read and writes. And just as a quick mention, technically M.2 is not the only platform that uh, NVMe SSDs work on. You can also get them in U.2 format and PCIe format, but uh, generally speaking, NVMe is most common in M.2. And finally, the last type of drive, which I don't actually have here, would be something like the uh, Intel 900P, which uses their Optane memory technology, which I won't cover too much here, as there's plenty of other people who've covered it very well, but um, those are PCIe SSDs. Those are ones that use your PCIe slots, either X1, X4, or sometimes even up to X16 slots to be able to directly interface with your processor and uh, often can be used as boot drives but also can be used as relatively dumb drives as well so there's a bit of a range. Moving on to a little bit lower level the main components on an SSD are really kind of two main things. You have the controller and the NAND flash. The controller is the thing that well controls the entire drive. It controls where the data is stored. It also does more advanced operations like trash cleanup and wear leveling uh, because when writing to NAND flash, you have to slightly damage it to be able to write to it, hence the read-write cycle life, uh, lifetime of a drive, you'll often be quoted as how much data can be written to a drive before it dies. So thanks to the controller, that's actually generally increased quite regularly with new controller technologies, and controllers are basically proprietary bits of hardware that you often really don't get to see inside at all. Now the NAND flash is actually pretty interesting, I'm going to cover it in full detail, in fact, basically now, but to give you a, a high level understanding, the NAND flash is a relatively sort of dumb block. It doesn't really do too much until the controller tells it to do something and that's basically just the substrate that the data is held in as opposed to any sort of actual computation or anything like that. So the NAND gates that make up the NAND flash are arranged in blocks and you have uh, data lines and address lines, uh, fairly similarly to uh, you know CPU registers and level one cache if you've ever studied you know computer science in any way. Um, and that's uh, the kind of basic design of them. I'll include a sort of image of how they are connected, but it's a relatively basic substrate that allows you to store data, so nothing uh, too complex, at least at this level anyway. I would also mention a couple of alternatives to NAND flash here. You can also get stuff like Intel's Optane, which uses their 3D crosspoint technology and is pretty cool. It basically offers uh, faster than NAND flash, but in theory easier to produce than DRAM, so you still have, it's still non-volatile storage, which means you can uh, effectively disconnect the power and the data still stays, but at the same time, it's uh, in theory faster and closer to uh, DRAM access speeds rather than you know SSD and NAND flash access speeds, which in, in comparison to DRAM is pretty slow. I would also mention that NOR flash is also a thing. It's uh, in theory a little bit faster, but a lot more difficult and a lot more costly to produce. So you often only see it in stuff like read-only memory, where you often don't need as much of it, and it's generally just not as popular as NAND flashes. So with that said. 
said, let's get into the details of NAND Flash. This is where it got most interesting for me, as I never really understood how the data can be stored in a chip in any way, especially when then I uh, you know, found out that it was made of transistors, and uh, knowing that transistors are basically just digital switches, uh, I didn't quite understand how that works. So I'm gonna give you at least a, an explanation that helped me understand it a bit better, and hopefully it gives you a bit of a better understanding too. So as I said, the NAND flash is wired in blocks and each of the transistors often are comprised of either floating gate transistors or charge trap transistors. These basically are standard, you know, MOSFET style transistors with a slight addition of, you can, you can think about it as a capacitor coupled across the, the gate. So normally with a, a MOSFET you have your gate, drain and source. Your gate is the thing that, uh, that when you apply a voltage to it, it either allows or doesn't allow uh, vo voltage to or amperage to pass through the gate drain connection. Uh, whereas with these types of transistors, especially with floating gate transistors, you basically have, as I said, you can think about it like having a capacitor coupled across it. When you charge the uh, capacitor, it means that the pass-through is there and it acts like a 1 or a 0 depending on the configuration. Whereas if the capacitor isn't charged, then it acts like the, the opposites with the channel closed, and then you can read that uh, out as your kind of outputs for your data. Now, I can't say that I know enough to really go into detail about floating gate transistors and charge trap transistors, but the, the general consensus is they're relatively similar, but the charge trap transistors are a lot more efficient at being able to write to them. It's the reason that Samsung uses them in their drives and is uh, it basically means that you don't have to uh, use as much voltage and damage the cells uh, or the transistors as much when writing to them, which obviously means that they last longer and means you can write more data to a drive. So to give you an idea of why the uh, cells get damaged when you write to them and why you have to use such a high voltage to actually write to them, relatively anyway, uh, it's basically because the if, if you think about the, the example I gave earlier with effectively a capacitor on the gate, to be able to charge that capacitor because it's isolated so that it can actually hold its charge, you have to effectively force electrons through the isolation barrier. That means that as you uh, force them very hard and you multiple electron volts, hot uh, electrons forcing through that barrier, you're effectively damaging the cell as you're forcing the electrons through it and therefore uh, you know, using something like hot carrier injection, which is one of the many techniques that you can use that effectively damages the oxide barrier there and means that uh, the, that sort of effectively capacitor, if you like, uh, loses its charge over time or is just physically unable to recharge itself after certain points, which means that that cell is then dead and therefore that block generally gets uh, kind of dead as well, um, depending on how many cells or how many uh, NAND flash units or transistors die in that block and that's where the controller comes in with wear leveling. So all of that gives a bit of an extra explanation as to how SSDs work, how the, the main components work, and obviously the NAND flash itself, which is one of the main technologies that we use in almost every device right now. It's a pretty interesting thing for me. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below, and I want to make it clear that I definitely am no expert in this field. It's something that I enjoy learning about, and if you are a bit more of an expert in the field, feel free to let me know if there's anything wrong, or if I kind of could understand anything better. Feel free to let me in the comments down below as I do definitely love learning about this and being able to share it with you guys as well. If you'd like to support these videos and keep me making them on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday basis, feel free to check out the Patreon link in the description down below if you want to support me there. You can also support me slightly less directly but still massively help me out by using the Amazon or Overclock UK affiliate links in the description down below. They massively help me out so I'd really appreciate it if you could use those when you can. There's also the subscribe button if you're new to the channel. There will be some other videos over here for you to check out. Otherwise, that is pretty much it. So thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. And otherwise, we'll see you all in the next video.